Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. We'd like to go ahead and get started with our forum today. I am Jeremy Parkinson, president of City Club of Boise. We are very excited to have you here today for this very important forum with the candidates for the Boise mayor runoff election. This is a historic event for the city of Boise and for City Club. We have over 300 people in attendance today, which goes to show how much interest there is in this election. I appreciate everyone's efforts in making this forum possible. We had less than a week to put it all together. Uh, as we all know, that the results didn't come out till Wednesday morning, and so there's a lot of work, a lot of volunteers, a lot of hard work went in a very short amount of time to make this happen. I'd really like to thank our staff, our City Club Manager, Daniel Trujillo, and City Club Development Manager, Morgan Keating, along with all the volunteers for their hard work. Thank, go ahead and let's give them a round of applause. Very excited to see a number of high school students with us today and their engagement. Thank Bora High School and their teacher, Karen Rue, for uh, having them here today. Joining and welcoming our students today. Before we get to the, uh, the, the program, I'd like to announce that, make a few of City Club announcements. We have a busy schedule coming up in the next couple of months. Let me remind you of some of our events. Tomorrow, I hope to see many of you at our signature event, the Stimson Award. That's going to be held tomorrow, 4.30 to 6.30 at Jump. As many of you know, each year, City Club of Boise recognizes an individual or a group of individuals with the Ed and Dottie Simpson Award for civic engagement. This year, Dr. Jim Weatherby was chosen by the board to receive this, and we're very excited to recognize him tomorrow at that event. I sure hope we have a lot of you there tomorrow. Upcoming forums, November 20th, Workforce Development. For years, industry and the trades have recognized there's a shortage of, of skilled laborers coming into that market. Many of the workforce are aging out of the profession, and young people are generally not encouraged to view this as a, as a uh, viable career. Come see what's being done to help with that. That's November 20th. December 5th, the fourth industrial revolution in cybersecurity. What are the big questions, issues, and obstacles facing us all, especially around cybersecurity? Idaho business and innovators are tackling these questions, creating products building solutions and providing employment opportunities. Come listen to that on December 5th. Have a couple tours coming up. December 3rd, there's going to be a hard hat tour of the new Ronald McDonald House. Get a first look at that, uh, that new development. On December 11th, we're going to have a tour of Gowan Field and the Idaho Military Museum. This is a free event, so I'm sure registration will fill up quickly. Be sure to register early. I'd like to remind you that by being a member of City Club, you mark your association to our mission of informed conversation about our community and current events. City Club works because people from across the community, people like you, understand that the critical issues we face, the technologies we use, the people who live here will surely change. Yet the need for civility does, civility does not. We believe civility is the ability to find common ground be good listeners, seek shared solutions, and learn and respect each other, even if we disagree. If you believe that, then you believe in City Club. Please visit our website at cityclubofboise.org to find out more about becoming a member. Now, I have a number of people to thank today for making this possible. Um, let me thank some supporters and send sponsors. Our forums and events are made possible because of generous support of our audience our members, and our sponsors. Our premier sponsor for 2019 is Northwest Nazarene University and the NNU College of Business. The Idaho Humanities Council is our other annual sponsor. Today's forum sponsor is Concordia University of Law. A special thanks goes out today to the League of Women Voters for their help and support today. We have several table sponsors in attendance, and we have one of our uh, annual forum series sponsors, Bank of Idaho, in attendance today. Finally, I would like to thank KTVB for streaming the event live on their website and the Grove Hotel for their uh, accommodations on such short notice. Please join me in thanking all of our great sponsors and supporters.
Our moderator will name other sponsors today for our radio audience. Just as a reminder, you can listen to broadcasts of City Club forums on the Boise State Public Radio the week of the forum on a Sunday and Tuesday nights. You can also listen to prior forums by visiting our website. I was just told that they're going to run a special uh, broadcast of this event tomorrow evening as well. So if any of your friends, neighbors, coworkers were not able to attend today, you can direct them to Boise State Public Radio to listen to it uh, tomorrow evening or get go onto our website later in the week. Without further ado, let's get to our program for today. Please silence your cell phones and welcome today's moderator, City Club Past President Bill Manny. Well, before we get started, I was going to urge you to start uh, doing your question cards, but I already have a stack this tall. So, so if, if you have questions at your table that haven't been asked, go ahead and, and uh, ask your question, hold them up, and, and I'll get to as many as we can. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Boise. I am Bill Manny. I'm a former president of Boise City Club, um, and I'm a documentary producer at Idaho Public Television. I'll be your moderator for today's forum. I'd like to welcome our radio audience today listening uh, via Boise State Public Radio on KBSX 91.5 and its affiliates in southern Idaho and northern Nevada. I'd like to ex extend a special welcome to the 64 students we have from Bora High School with us today. And to our co-sponsors, the League of Women Voters of the Greater Boise Region. Today's forum is made possible in part because of City Club partners and sponsors. Thank you to our media partners, Boise State Public Radio, 670 KBOI, Idaho Statesman, Idaho Public Television, Pepper Shock Media, our university partners, University of Idaho, Boise State University, and Northwest Nazarene University, and today's forum sponsor, Concordia Law School. Thank you, and let's give them a round of applause. A reminder for everybody, the mission of City Club is civil dialogue and respectful conversations, so please no hooting, no applauding, no cheering, no booing during today's forum. Um, and also for everybody's edification, Eleanor Cheehy from the League of Women Voters will be today's uh, uh, traffic cop. She'll be, she'll be keeping uh, track of the time for the answers and the remarks. So 15 second warning and a stop sign. Okay, today is day seven in the 29 day mayoral runoff. The first ever Boise mayoral runoff, at least since 1965. <laughs> Election day is December 3rd. Boise voters can vote early at Boise City Hall and at the county elections office on Benjamin Lane for two weeks beginning Monday, November 18th through Friday, December, uh, December, November 29th, and, we'll, and they'll be taking Thanksgiving Day off, as I'm sure all of us will from uh, political discussions around our tables. <laughs> One week ago today, Boise voters gave Lauren McLean 45.7% of the vote in the election for Boise mayor. They gave Dave Beter 30.3%. Since none of the seven candidates received the 50% plus one that it requires, we have uh, moved to the elimination round. <laughs> Our candidates need little introduction, so I will make it short and sweet. In alphabetical order, we have Dave Beter, who has been mayor for 16 years. 
He got his law degree from the University of Idaho. He represented Boise in the Idaho legislature for four years until he won election as Boise's 54th mayor in 2003. He's been reelected in 2007, 2011, and 2015. Lauren McLean grew up primarily in Texas and came to Boise in 1998. She got involved in Boise politics managing the 2001 Foothills Open Space Levy Campaign. She served on the Parks Commission and the PNZ and was, and was appointed to the council by Mayor Beter in 2011. She won election in 2015 and since 2017 she has served as council president. She has a master's degree in public administration from Boise State. And uh, with a coin toss uh, before this event, uh, Lauren won and she will go first. And so I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks so much um, to City Club and League of Women Voters for pulling this off so quickly. To everyone here in the room, I can't believe how many people there are who knew that we all like politics this much. And of course, to our lady over radio listeners, I'm Lauren McLean, and it's an honor to be here today. Like so many of you in this room and listening on the radio, I wasn't born here, but my husband, Scott, and I, we met in high school, we got married right out of college, and after we graduated and got married, we were looking for a place to build a life, and we were so lucky to find Boise, like so many of us have. On that first time, I, I knew nothing about this place, and the first time I saw Boise, was the foothills as we were landing, and the oranges of that late March day are reflected by so many artists in what they choose to paint about this place that we love. I fell in love on a run in the foothills and knew that this was home. We were lucky enough to find jobs, to have a university that provided us with opportunity so that we could afford to buy a home, build a life, and raise great kids like Aiden, who's here today, and our daughter, she's away at school. I have heard from so many people throughout the city as I've listened at your doorsteps in coffee shops that you're afraid that your kids won't be able to do the same. And I share that concern that ours won't either. Last week, this city truly recognized that we're at a crossroads, that we have new challenges, that we need fresh perspective and new leadership. And I tell you, it's an incredible honor to have received your vote last week. But I know that we will continue these conversations that I've been having with thousands of you for the last several months. And hope in the course of today when we're talking about the big challenges at hand, that I'm able to earn your vote again on December 3rd and really look forward to the conversation today. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Beaton. Well, I too want to uh... Uh, express gratitude to City Club. Uh, this is a crazy good crowd, and I'm happy to be here. And I know you've been recognized so many times, but here's to you, Bora Alliance out there. Can you wave your hands? I'm from uh, down the ditch bank at Bishop Kelly, but uh, I, I hope you won't hold that against me. I, uh, well, this is uh, really all you can ask of an uh, election is that you get an opportunity uh, to go one-on-one -on -one and talk about the issues and talk about the contrast uh, between you uh, and the opposition. You know, uh, when it was seven of us, uh, it's really hard to talk about the issues, uh, especially when you're the incumbent, uh, and they're all kind of looking to bash you. Uh, but now it's one-on-one, -on -one, and now it is, uh, it's time to talk about where we want to go for the future. And uh, more than anything else, uh, the job of being mayor is about making tough decisions, making those tough decisions and, and, and staying with them. Decisions in the long-term best interests of the city. And I tell you, there are a number of those, but maybe no more important than how we address the least fortunate of our citizens. We have done more for the homeless in Boise than any city that I know of. We're having such, such success. We have New Path, where 45 people who have been chronically homeless have a place to stay. We have Valor Point for our veterans that opens up in a couple months. 
But what we can't have are camps for the homeless. That is the opposite of compassion. Uh, I had to make a tough decision to disband Cooper Court, one of the toughest decisions that I've ever made. Uh, but I can't tell you how many people uh, have thanked me for that decision and have told me that the future of Boise depends on our keeping our streets safe and clean and helping our homeless and not uh, allowing those. I'm, that is, the, I think, the, the most important issue in this campaign. How are we going to deal with growth? I have dealt with the most intense growth that we've ever seen in our valley and the deepest recession that any of us, uh, absent maybe a few of you, have ever seen. Uh, and that experience is what we need to go forward. Uh, I, I am looking forward to this uh, next few weeks. I hope to have your vote and hope to continue as your mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I would ask you to hold your applause now during the Q&A and then we'll have a chance uh, for applause at the end of the, end of the event. Um, a lot of questions about the library. Surprise. Um, yesterday, uh, yesterday, Mayor, you announced that uh, you wanted to hit a reset. But both of you have supported, in one form or another, uh, expensive investment in a new library. Um, but last week, voters overwhelmingly said that they want a check on city spending on big projects. So the question I have for both of you, and I'll start with you, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, first, is is this not a rebuke for the last 16 years or eight years uh, for the councilwoman on the way you've been handling spending? And how will you, as the city leader, approach big spending decisions in the future? Well, the citizen spoke, and, uh, and I respect that. Um, it is an important part of, uh, of what we're talking about. But I tell you, uh, I had paused the library several months ago. Uh, and my opponent only talked about that after I had said that. She has been fundamental to all these decisions going forward. Uh, and I tell you, like the branch libraries now that everybody loves, uh, we went out and got 57 percent. It wasn't 66 and two-thirds percent. But we found a way to give you branch libraries, which is a central service of the city of Boise, and now everybody loves them. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to go out here and we're going to find a way to give you that. And that's what being the mayor is about. I respect what the citizen said. The new main library is an important part of what we'll do. We will re-engage and get it right so that all of you uh, are happy with it. Uh, but that's what being the mayor is about. Find a way to give uh, the people what they want. They do want a new library. Uh, the project, as stated, won't go on the ballot, uh, but that's what I've done. Every, virtually everything we've been able to accomplish, you go out first, you try, you retool, and you go out again. Uh, uh, whether it's the branch libraries or Allen Baugh House Community Detox Center, or whether it's uh, the, the uh, fire bond, where we're able to go back and get it done. Uh, that's what this job is about, and I'm prepared to do that. Councilwoman. Thank you. I have always believed that we could both listen to the people, honor the constitutional right that we have to bring a ballot measure to the ballot, and accomplish a great library for this city. It takes leaders to propose a project, to, to accept and, and say yes, that I was part of it, but also to reflect when we've listened to what the public have said and realize that we can do better. And back in February, when there was a conflict over the cabin, I did just that. I said we made some mistakes, that we didn't create the parameters around the project that we should, and the people were responding because of that. And it's because I listened to the community, heard the reaction that folks had to the project, and recognized that it is possible to have a library that's so important to our community, that creates opportunity and access for our kids up through our retirees. And at the same time, I have been clear this entire election that I would honor the vote on Tuesday. I have to say I wasn't surprised by the outcome. You all knew how I voted. I was really upfront about that. 
But from the thousands of conversations I've had throughout this year, it was clear that Boiseans want a library, but they want leaders that listen, reflect on what they've heard, and are able to share their vision and get a project done. And I believe that that's possible with a vote and with a vision, rather than, as the mayor has said in the past, going to the courts to throw the people's vote out. So I'm going to follow up on that because if Yes, it was a question for both, and that was in that equal, the had equal amount of time. And the, the same follow-up question: uh, uh, Why don't we ask one minute for each of them? And so, actually, I've, so are we not supposed to answer both? I'm, or no, you, you, did you did it correctly. Okay, great. Yes. Um, so the the rules were two minutes for answer, one minute for rebuttal. But in this case, they both answered e equally, and I think that's and 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 when we have that when we have that case, I think that's the way we should handle it. Okay. I'm going to ask a follow-up question and ask them uh, to each respond for one minute each. Do you interpret the votes on Proposition 1 and 2 as criticism for the way the city has overseen its spending, and how will you handle that differently in the future, Councilwoman? Sure, I interpret the vote as a clear statement that the public wants to be involved in high-ticket items, but most importantly, that they want us to react um, as leaders to the feedback that we get when we present proposals. So I believe that it's on us as mayor to lead a conversation about these larger ticket items, to speak to the value of library in this case, and then to get it done in a way that the community celebrates it. And with a vote, you can get there. Okay, thank you. Mayor? Well, uh, that's the way it is. Uh, Lauren wants to have it all ways. She never raised an issue about the process of uh, getting to the library decision. We have 30 outreach efforts uh, we'll do 30 more. Uh, it's important to get it right, and the, and the project as proposed is not going to go on the ballot. We understand that. But you can't have it always. You can't be for things until it's hard. Uh, that's what this job is about, is making tough decisions. And we're going to go forward, engage the public. I believe they want a new library that is representative of our community. That's what I've done time and again, and that's what I'm positioned to do uh, on this project. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, I guess I would, uh, following up on that, how do you interpret the vote as a comment on the way the citizens have been consulted on spending projects in the past? I think the, the, the vote is not a, a, a vote on uh, spending projects. It's, and if it is, it's the council that has control over the budget. Uh, we have done uh, years of incredible uh, public outreach and decisions on what we invest in. We've invested in 15 new parks. We've, we have our 10th recreation center that we just dedicated, the branch libraries that everybody loves. They uh, are with us. We, we survey every two years and understand what you want, and our citizens tell us you've gotten good value. They want in on this project. God bless you. Uh, you're, you're, now you're engaged. You weren't before. Uh, we will re-engage you, uh, and we'll get it right. Uh, that's what it's all about. But it's not, uh, it's not a vote on the, on the overall spending priorities of the city. It's a vote on these two projects, and we'll make sure we get them right. Have you had your say? Okay. So, um, for our radio audience, I want to remind you that you're listening to a City Club of Boise forum with the candidates for Boise mayor in the runoff for December 3rd. And just a note for our audience in the room, the broadcast will be Wednesday night at 8 p.m. The first one, of course, there'll be several more rebroadcasts, but the first one will be Wednesday night at 8 p.m. on 91.5. So there are a bunch of questions um, f uh, about listening, uh, about temperament and about um, uh, when do you change your mind? So let me ask you both, and I'll start with you, Mr. Mayor. When have you changed your mind on a decision after you've gathered more information? And do you think you do a good job of listening to people? I started, I listen all the time. I didn't start six months ago. Uh, a couple months into when I was elected, I started doing Saturday office hours where you can come on a Saturday and get your 10 minutes with the mayor. And it's been wildly popular. We fill up every time slot. I meet with uh, refugees every couple months. I meet with businesses every month. 
I've met with neighborhood associations. I meet with the Boise Young Professionals. I meet with people who stop me down the street, and they do it all the time, uh, all around the city. Uh, so I've been listening the whole time, not just for uh, uh, the last six months. Uh, and I forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> what was the rest Have you ever of that? changed your mind? Oh, gosh, the easiest one is uh, facial recognition, folks. Uh, we, the, the single most important issue to our employees is safety. And you look around the country, especially in public uh, places, and our employees uh, uh, want to be safe. And we thought that understanding who might come in if there's a restraining order or they've had trouble in the past uh, would alert us. Uh, unfortunately, so many cities and governmental groups around the country have fouled that up uh, to the point that people are suspect. So we, we said, we're not going to do that. We're going to find a, another way to keep you safe. Uh, it was clear. Uh, and our employees understand that, and we've re-engaged, and we'll make sure we keep them safe in a different way. Thank you. So listening and mind-changing. Sure. Now, that, that has been such a crux of the conversations that we've had during the course of this campaign. And, but before I get to where you know, stories from people that I carry with me have allowed me to think differently about an idea, I want to point out that as, when I became council president, I was hearing from people, that they wanted to engage with us in ways that weren't so conflict-ridden, like over applications with us from the dais looking down on the public. So we started town halls, held those in so many different places. I started Facebook Live weekly updates so that people could better understand what was happening at City Council, because I want to make it more accessible so that people can engage more easily. And then through the course of the winter, as we were hearing more and more people upset with decisions being made or how they were being made, feeling shut out and talked over at City Hall, I started holding listening sessions. Didn't know what to expect when I walked in the room. But what I found, the first one, 67 people. Standing room only, we had to go outside. Not angry, but wanting to talk about they, what they expected from their leaders, how they wanted us to see them actively engage them in conversations, and think about the decisions we were being made. I've continued to have those and have had over 30 as a candidate now. I text with voters on a daily basis and will continue to do that. And I've personally knocked thousands of doors and had conversations with you at your doorsteps. And the things that I've learned over the course of this or have helped me change my mind on a couple things. I'm going to point out the stadium first. I was always open to the concept. I visited the stadium in Fort Wayne. But as I heard from folks about the urgency of affordability and affordable housing, frustration that traffic was getting worse and they want us to do something about it, I started recognizing that public dollars were better spent in areas that address today's urgent challenges. And when deals were tried to be made where money from the Grove Plaza would go to a stadium, it made me really skeptical and again kind of made me think I need to think twice about this, especially as I'm hearing from the public that there's not enough transparency around it. In every single one of these listening sessions I've had, for those of you listening, for those of you here, I've met so many of you at them, I can tell you that I've walked away knowing so much more about the city and her people than I did before, and it influences the way I think about every single issue before us. Sorry. Time's up. Thank you. Um, um, several questions about temperament, so let's just, uh, let's just confront the elephant in the room. Some people find you standoffish, Councilwoman. Other people find you stubborn. So why don't we start with the mayor? <laughs> and I would say the, the other thing is uh, uh, people are saying you're being disloyal for running against the mayor who appointed you to office. So let's start with you. Are you stubborn? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, my wife is in the front row here, and I'm looking right at her. And uh, for the radio audience, uh, she's nodding her head. I know. Uh, uh, I am stubborn in the right ways. Uh, this is a difficult job, uh, and you have to make tough decisions, and you have to stay with them. And I could tell you dozens of uh, decisions. Uh, the branch libraries are just one of them. Uh, you know. You, you went out for a bond, you didn't get 66 and two-thirds, which is a crazy high threshold. 
And I said, no, we, we need that in our neighborhoods. We need to help people have a place to learn. Uh, and that is stubborn. Yes, it is. And it's stubborn in all the right ways. Again, uh, when it comes to the toughest decision that I've ever made was to give the order to take down Cooper Court and move the camps. I lost friends over it. I lost sleep over it. You bet I was stubborn. Uh, and you should be thankful, and I know you are thankful that I was stubborn in that way. Uh, I will change when I need to. I've got uh, a lot of examples of that. Uh, but uh, I will stay with tough decisions, and that's uh, fundamental to this job. Thank you. Councilwoman? That I'm standoffish. Standoffish and disloyal. And disloyal. <laughs> you know, the standoffish thing is interesting because the truth of it is I'm an introvert. And introverts can do lots of things, but I believe deeply in the things I care about, feel a sense of urgency when I want to take things on, and at the end of the day, I'm truly one of those people that just likes to hide. And for me, it's on my bike or with my running shoes in the hills. And so I'm sure that at times that comes off as standoffish or urgent or wanting to do too much at the wrong time. And I've learned so much talking with so many people throughout this city. I've learned one that I'm not as introverted as I might have thought or I can put a good face on all of this. Um, but through deep connection and commitment to a city and to our people and to a place, you can do great things together, and it takes those partnerships. And this isn't about a person. This is about the future of our community. And I heard time and time again this spring, and you said on Tuesday that you are looking for something new. You want to have conversations as a community that we haven't had, that it was time to address urgently housing, transportation, jobs that pay us what we live to, need to live here. And so I stepped into a race, and it was a super tough decision, but it's made possible these conversations. It's been an incredible honor, and day by day I recognize that this isn't about me or about the incumbent mayor. This is about Boise and her people. So the second half of that question, and let's give her a, a briefly t a minute. Are you disloyal for running against the mayor who appointed you in 2011? I just said, I think that this was about stepping up for this city. And I feel that I did it for the people of the city, for our kids and their kids and the future that we all need to have. And that's what this is about. Not about pledging allegiance or loyalty to one person, but pledging my love to this city that has created a home and given my family a life. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you also for the brevity. Um, several questions about term limits. So let's start with uh, Councilwoman. Uh, I think you've talked about it, a self-imposed term limit. Do you believe in, so what would your term limit be and would you impose, would you, uh, impose one legally? So as, um, you know, as a council member, it's the council that passes laws. So we'd have to have that conversation as a community with the council. Um, I've said all along that I thought it was really important to impose or commit to a personal limit and that would be no more than three terms because we have to, have a sense of urgency daily to tackle the challenges of this city. We have to know that our time is limited so we won't destroy relationships, but instead we'll build and maintain them so that we can accomplish the things we know we must. And it's human nature when you have a good gig to want to just stay there. And I want to make it clear that leaders need to evolve with a city as the mayor has said at past forums, when you have a new administration, you have an opportunity to ask things, questions differently, have new conversations, change an agenda, and that's what having a term limit on myself will allow the city to do beyond me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I think the implication of that is, isn't 16 years enough? Well, uh, you know, Bill, uh, do you tell your accountant, you know, you've just too experienced for me. I, I want a new accountant. I want somebody that hasn't done anything. Uh, you know, do you tell your nurse, uh, you know, you're, you've been a nurse for 16 years. I don't want you to work for me. I want some new nurse that hasn't worked on anybody. Uh, it's interesting that term limits come up now 
that she's running for this office, but apparently term limits don't apply when you're a council member. Uh, I guess that's fine. Term limits, you always have the right to limit people's terms, and I believe in that. You have this kind of discussion, and you make a decision. Uh, you know, that's just so much bunk. Uh, we have 1,700 employees. You've got to make tough decisions every day. Who's going to be in? Who's going to be out? Uh, I've made all those decisions to the point that things are going so well that you don't even think about that. Well, you were thinking about it when I came into office. It was a train wreck. People didn't want to work for the city of Boise. Now it's where you want to be. I want to take a great city and make it even better. Uh, I don't believe in them, uh, and it's interesting that people are born again now uh, that they want to run for something else. So a number of questions about specific issues, which I, I will start in on next, but let's ask this question, which is how do you envision uh, keeping Boise a welcoming place for newcomers and refugees? Mayor, why don't you go first? And I would say uh, if we could keep these answers to a minute, we could get through more of these questions. <laughs> that, is, that assumes we want to get to more questions, Bill. <laughs> we want to answer questions. Uh, anyway, uh, I am uh, the son of uh, uh, a mother who was uh, a first-generation uh, Boisean. Her parents were immigrants, uh, and she struggled with that. Didn't speak English when she came, when she first went to school. And that experience has informed the way I view this job and the way I view our city. We are a welcoming city to everyone, to immigrants, to refugees. We have the longest standing refugee organization in the country because we started it 10 years ago. Uh, and the arts are a great way to get other cultures and other people uh, into our city. Again, whether you're an immigrant, a refugee, or God bless you, whether you're from California, you are war welcome in the city of Boise. Uh, and we're just going to do more of that. It is who we are. Uh, it is where we're going to be. Uh, and our record on that is second to none. Uh, we need to keep doing that. And that's where Boise Kind comes in, to retain that small town central kindness and civility that's made Boise a great place to live. Thank you, Mayor. Councilwoman? This city has forever opened her arms to all comers, whether it be immigrants and refugees, whether it be people like so many of us, myself and Scott included. Um, it's provided and our people have provided strong neighborhoods for us, incredible culture, yes, great arts. And it is so incredibly important that we continue to do that, that we tell the story of what a welcoming place we are, that we embrace diversity and the richness of culture that comes with the refugees that find our place, create a home, and seek a better life. For those of you who come from so many other places as well, I was proud as a council member to sponsor our Welcoming Cities resolution to put our values in writing, and will continue, of course, as mayor, to do more of those, to continue the conversations about where we head next and how we strengthen the richness and diversity that's in our community that makes Boise so special. Thank you. Um, a bunch of questions uh, that center around growth. And let me, uh, I guess, let me preface that by saying that there does seem to be a sense of unease about, the, about how fast and how high uh, town is growing. And I think that underlines some of these questions. But there's questions about infrastructure and affordable housing and homelessness. So let's start with, let's start with homelessness. Um, and we'll start with you, Councilwoman. Um, Clearly, the, the Cooper Court and the lawsuit are, are kind of the flashpoints in this conversation, but they are only symptoms or elements of what is a more difficult and broader issue. So what is your plan for homelessness? And I would say if they need two minutes, let's give them two minutes for that. Sure. I'm going to get right to the point on this one. I do not support encampments. Nobody supports encampments. Absolutely nobody. To say otherwise is disingenuous at best and is breeding fear on the backs of those who are most marginalized in our community. I know that we can do better. 
saying we have to throw people in jail, write them tickets, we got to ask ourselves, is that going to keep them off the streets? What if the court next week says they're not going to hear the case? Or what if the Supreme Court takes the case and rules that ticketing people for sleeping is unconstitutional? What do we as a city do then? I know that we can do it without that. Saying we have to have this tool to put people in jail, write tickets, diminishes the good work of people in this community that are working day by day to prevent evictions that increase homelessness. Working day by day to connect those on the streets with the services that they need to be able to move into a shelter and into a home. And hopefully in the long term find a job without a record. It diminishes the work of the shelters who are coming up with the solutions and asking us as a city to continue to invest in them. So much has changed since Cooper Court. We have permanent supportive housing. We have better coordination of services. We can be a model city if we lead with Boise values of compassion and justice and kindness and get real in recognizing that the solutions are here if we're vigilant to protect camps, if we don't allow ourselves to have what happened in the cities the mayor mentions all the time. I know that we can do this, and I am committed to leading that conversation. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? We are a model city. Folks, they visit me all the time. What are you doing in Boise? That's working. And what we're doing is uh, fashioning remedies for people like New Path. 45 chronically homeless people have a place to live for the last seven months because of the city of Boise. Another uh, almost 30 uh, homeless uh, veterans will have a great place to stay uh, in just a couple months and both of them have the services they need to help them. Catch was a city program, and we rolled it out. Allenbaugh House is a community detox and crisis mental health center that we could never get done until I did it. All of these things are the compassion of the city of Boise and many, many more, whether it's the rescue mission or all kinds of programs. But you cannot have camps. You cannot have it both ways. We are the model. Uh, you can we, we, uh, took down Cooper Court in the best way of any city in the country, and it only came up because our officers mistakenly thought they couldn't issue citations in that short time. And within a matter of weeks, there it was. Uh, we hoped that the winter would, uh, would disrupt, and it didn't. You have to do both things, ladies and gentlemen. The toughest decision I've ever made was to take down that camp. Again, I've lost friends. I've lost more sleep than you know. But that's what being the mayor is about. We are the model uh, in the country. Look around. Vancouver, Washington repealed their ordinance within weeks. Camp springing up. I can't tell you how many people sent the election and said, we don't want to be like Seattle. We can't be like Portland and San Francisco. That's what makes Boise, Boise. This is the central issue of this campaign. Uh, and uh, I'll make those tough decisions to move forward. Thank you. Let's stick to housing for just a minute. A number of questions about affordable housing. And let's wrap that into uh, uh, several other questions. Uh, what is your plan for affordable housing, protecting our neighborhoods, and, and while, while not driving property taxes higher? And why don't we start with you, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Grow Our Housing is an initiative that we've been working on for a couple years. Uh, and the great example of how it works uh, was just a couple weeks ago, right on Fairview Avenue. Uh, at Adair. Uh, we have 130 units of housing, uh, beautiful housing. One of the few times that a project looks better built than it did in the drawings. We've all seen those drawings and there's people walking around. Uh, this one looks better built than it did drawn. And we have affordable workforce and market housing all in the same project, uh, all close to where there are services. That is our model uh, to take city property as often as we can, private property, and lower the cost of housing. The financial community is stepping up to talk to us. We're going to leverage everything we have uh, to make uh, affordable housing all across the city. 
the tool of uh, of CCDC is so important to that to that future, and that's what we want to bring to other areas of Boise. Uh, it's a tough lift. Let's be honest. We also have to approve housing. We have to approve dense, multi-use, walkable, bikeable communities. Time, that's time. what this is all about. Time's up, Mayor. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's a big question, and two minutes is a short time, but housing, property taxes, and protecting our neighborhoods. Well, it's a big question, and it's, it's a big issue this election. I mean, I've heard from thousands of people that um, you're experiencing an affordability crisis, that you're concerned that your kids won't come back here because they can't buy a house, that you might have to move when you retire because property taxes have gone up, and related to growth, too, that if you find a job that provides you better opportunity, you can't necessarily get there because we don't have the transportation systems we need. We need. I have to make tough votes every week on housing and talk often about how, as our city grows up, we're going to grow up and closer to each other, denser. And we protect our quality of life in doing this by reimagining what gathering places look like, by creating pathways for people that connect them from home to neighborhood school, to work, to the coffee shop, and allow people to commute in different ways. We need to protect open spaces as quickly as we are developing. And we've got to have real conversations about the urgency of this affordability crisis that we're experiencing, the impact that low wages have on that, and the tools that we ought to be trying to create people-scaled housing faster and better and quicker for our residents. I was just about to call you on time, and you finished up. Time. Thank you. Here's something. Here's easy and uh, and short. <laughs> yeah, right. <Bill>. Uh. <laughs> cell phones. Will you support a ban on driving while using your cell phone in Boise? Why don't we start with uh, Councilwoman McLean? I would, because thank goodness for Aiden. Every time I start to creep my hand over towards my phone, he's like, get, get your hand away from your phone. And we all need that reminder of how it's incredibly unsafe to have phones near us when we drive. And we're not seeing it happen on its own. So I think an ordinance just like Meridian and other places is a really good idea. Mayor? No problem with that. Uh, we agree on this. It's already illegal to text while you're driving in Idaho, I believe, uh, just to reinforce it. So it should be cell phone use. Self self use. Use. Yeah. Hands free. A hands free. Hands free. Has that just has that has that not come up yet? How come we haven't well, seen action? If people you're both, have their phones, if everybody's Bill, unanimous. People have their phones. Look out there. They're all using them right now as we're talking. <laughs> uh, but it is uh, it, it, it it is an issue. Okay. So here's another easy one, <laughs> uh, Mayor. How do you feel about taxpayers funding all or part of a sports stadium? <laughs> Uh, easy one, Bill. Thank you. Uh, uh, i got to make an important distinction. Uh, if there is going to be a, a stadium with, uh, with taxpayer funding, it's the room tax from the auditorium district that we pay everywhere we travel. And people that come to Boise uh, pay as well. Uh, that is the bulk of any public money that's ever going to go into a stadium. I'm happy to talk about this because somehow that got lost in the shuffle. Uh, a room tax, the auditorium district exists for auditorium theaters and, and, uh, and sports parks. That's why that funding source exists. Uh, if, it's, if it's paid for that way, we ought to look at it and a private developer. Playing ball is a great thing. People love to come out and support a team. Sometimes I think that's all we have together is to stand behind a sports team. You know, you can't talk about politics anymore. You can't talk about religion ever. But how about those Broncos, huh? We're all behind them. We need that kind of thing and a place to go to concert uh, and to recreate that's affordable and accessible. If it's paid for in that way, you bet. Sports stadium. Sure, and, and you know, I, I touched on this earlier. This is one of those areas where I, you know, supportive of the, of the concept early on. We've heard about the stadium for 16 years. The needs of the city have changed drastically. Often the mayor paints the picture when we're talking about homelessness of Seattle, San Francisco, um, Portland. Those mayors built stadiums before they addressed affordability and transportation and all these things to prevent the, what, what we now see in those communities with regard to camps. In 2018, I think it was the budget of 2018 or 2017, there was a $3 million line item from the city of Boise to go towards a stadium. And I held that 
in a motion until we could have a hearing and see a real plan because as a council member, you don't support something until you see whether or not the investment's worthy of the money. That $3 million sat there and was held because I held it. I've continued to listen and now understand that there are so many things like housing and transportation that our residents expect us to spend city dollars on before we do these other large legacy projects. Can I address that, Bill, real quickly? Um, yes, but then you well, get a chance to sure. rebut as well. Uh, you just heard it. I was for it until it got difficult, and then I was against it. I put, I, you know, I was, I, I proposed that budget, and then I held it. It's, you know, you can't have things every way, folks. Uh, we're going to do both things: affordable housing and a place where people can have fun. But we're going to do things at once. That's what this job is to do: multi task to do things uh, that are for the long-term best interest of the city. Councilwoman. I want to be clear that as council members, we have to take actual votes. And in that budget presented to us by the mayor, there's a line item that I held because we hadn't had a public hearing and we hadn't seen a proposal. I have always, always been committed to a public process. And that's what was required before I would approve holding money aside, stashed aside for a stadium that we hadn't seen a proposal. It wasn't right for the people. It definitely wasn't right as council members to do that. This has always been about a legacy project. Whoa. And you've asked us tonight, Whoa. today, what we've learned if we ever hear from the public and think differently about our thoughts on how we should move forward. I heard loud and clear for many years, starting with that budget item, that you guys wanted us to be thinking about other things. I reflected on that and stand by my decision that this is not the right time to do this for Boise. We have to address affordable housing tra and transportation with Bill, we, dollars. We, we can't let that go. Uh, my legacy is my daughter. And that is humbling and difficult, and all you parents out there know that. That's the only legacy that matters to me. You make tough decisions for the future of the city, and you, in a city that I, I was born and raised in, uh, my daughter represents the fourth generation of people living here, and I want to give her the best city that we can give. Uh, but she's my legacy. There isn't a building or a project or a sports park or anything else that matters like that. And I'm glad you mentioned it, because I don't give a damn about it in that setting. Uh, I, I care about her. Well, but Mr. Mayor, uh, there's nothing wrong with leaving a legacy. Right. So, so I, I know, I, why don't you respond to that? When you say legacy, what do you mean? And, and given what he just said, how do you, how do you phrase the, that notion of a legacy project? Sure, a, le a legacy as an elected official, which one cannot deny in your time, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, you've done great things. And p you leave buildings behind as well, or you've worked to do that. There is no comparison between having a debate about a large-scale building and the importance of our children in this community or in our lives. To me, that's a totally different no, no, no. level of legacy. It's, it, it's the same, and that's what, you, that's what she was implying, that I want a building with my name on it. I don't read, do you guys read plaques when you go into public buildings? I never read those. And I'm a public official. I don't care what that says. Uh, I have never, this is one of the most charged terms, and she meant it in that way. Well, well fair uh, enough. You've responded, okay. and I think you both explained your point, so I yes. thank you both, and let's move on. Um, mass transit. Uh, what, does, uh, what does Boise and the Treasure Valley need? What does Treasure Valley need from Boise in order to make mass transit work? And I forgot who went first on that last one. So why don't we start with you, mass transit. Sure. So we are 20 years behind on our regional transportation system. It's not just mass transit. We need to have pathways for people, ways to move people throughout our community from home to work, because as our traffic and congestion gets worse, we have to do everything we can to get as many cars off the roads as possible. And as a year-round commuter, my husband and I both know that there are many parts of the city that need better pathways for people. We also have been trying for 16 years to get the local option tax from the legislature. We've got to try a different way because we're now 20 years behind on a regional transportation system that should include connections to Caldwell so that people can come in and out more easily from our, our city. Connections out State Street towards Middleton, out Federal Way towards Mountain Home, and of course bus connections in between. I believe that you do that 
by creating consensus among leaders, by partnering in different ways with the state, so that there's a recognition that the success of this region relies on having a modern day transportation system. We can't do what we've always and continued to try to do. We've got to try to do it differently so that we can get those funds to implement the programs that we need in order to move people from work to home. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Well, boy, am I happy to talk about this issue. A tough, tough issue, Bill. Uh, the first time, Lauren, that you've ever been to a Valley Regional Transit meeting was two months ago. That is a fact, ladies and gentlemen. She talks about consensus across the valley. She doesn't know those people across the valley. If she'd been to those meetings, dozens and dozens that I've been to, what you learn is they have a really tough time dedicating any money to transit. They have to do police and fire and libraries and parks and everything that we do. And on top of that, try to do some transit. Uh, we have a consensus that we need transit across the whole valley. But the first job, not, you know, the old ad is 90% of, of jobs are showing up. If you don't show up at Valley Tr Regional Transit meetings, if you miss a quarter of the council meetings, which is your job, uh, you're not ready to build consensus. That's an election time adage. Uh, what we need is funding, folks. That's what you got to have. You can't have bake sales for transit. We have leveraged everything we've had. We've uh, dedicated another million bucks uh, to our bus systems on priority routes. I'm the only elected official that's ever taken transit to a Valley Regional Transit meeting. Time. And it's tough, ladies and gentlemen. So it's you really need to respond. Hard. Bill, thanks. The mayor knows how this works. Yeah. I'm an alternate to Valley Regional Transit, a relatively new alternate. I attended the meeting in August, and I was glad I was there because I needed to vote because the mayor wasn't there on the budgets for the buses um, for the next year. At the League of Women Voters meeting, he described this as a slog, working, going to Valley Regional Transit. We need new energy and urgency to try something in a different way. That d a leader that doesn't look at this work as a slog, but instead an opportunity to create new partnerships, to bring urgency to the table, and recognize that our community depends on it, because what's been going on for the last 16 years hasn't worked to get us where we need to be. Bill, urgency is nine years of not attending. You can be the person that the council sends to Valley Regional Transit meetings, and Elaine Clegg is always that person. She's never gone, she's never cared. Urgency is doing it every month for all those years. I really, truly thank Elaine Clegg for her service on Valley Regional Transit, because she has been the council representative. So uh, we have about uh, three or four minutes until we get to closing arguments, and uh, I'd like to get a couple more questions in. And we moved off the library without addressing the question about the cabin. And so cabin, stay or move, regardless of the library. And I don't, who, who went first that last time? I, think, I did. I think you did. So Mr. Mayor, uh, you've, reset the, you've reset the library discussion. What, what do you want to see happen to the cabin? Well, it remains to be seen. Uh, it, it is a discussion that we're going to have. And we're going to see the most important thing is, is, is that cabin be retained. We have a great spot in Julia Davis. The cabin board, many of your members are here, would prefer to go because it's crowded now. It's going to get more crowded when we expand the library. Uh, Council Member McLean and the council voted to move it. Uh, but it depends on uh, where we go with the new design uh, and what happens. Regardless, it's going to be retained. It's going to be retained in a great spot. Really quickly, the state sold it to the city, and in the land board meeting, the minutes say to retain or move uh, 30 years ago. Uh, either one works. Uh, we're going to protect it and have a, a great future for the cabin. Uh, Kevin, question for you. Sure. I think the crux of it is that we have to have a conversation with the cabin program, with cabin advocates, with the community as part of the new library conversation. And right now we're imagining this as an either or because of what the current library framework looks like and it's crowded. Um, and then what we had to do in terms of a vote because there was no appetite for redesign to move it to try to retain its structure but also the integrity of the programming. So I see this as an opportunity to again listen to lead a conversation, to come up with that right answer that's integrated and connected in some way to the 
library as we see it next, and the land in the park that the cabin's looking forward to, to using. So this questioner said, why are you allowing the mayor to interrupt Lauren McLean's answer? So if, I've, if I haven't allowed that, I apologize. You know, the notion, this is the first time they've gone head to head. And so I hope that we'd have a bit of give and take, uh, respectful, uh, but challenging. So if, I, if I've let it go a little too far, I apologize um, uh, in advance or at the end, I guess. Um, we, have, we, have, uh, we have time for one last question, if you could be very brief. But if you are not elected as Boise's next mayor, how do you plan to move forward and support your opponent? So why don't we start with Councilwoman McLean? That's a great question. And one, because I jumped into this race and it was a risk and taking on a 16-year incumbent is really hard. I've been grappling with on most of the trail runs that I've done in the last six months. I love the city. And whoever wins this race has the responsibility and that mantle to move us forward, to address these new challenges that we have, and to create consensus and bring our community together. So that will be on me, if I'm not mayor, to support this mayor, to support our city, and to continue doing what I love to do, which is connect with people, talk about how incredible this community is to me and to all of us, and to find my way to continue to impact, as, impact it as I have for the last 20 years. Mayor, how will you put hard feelings aside and move ahead if oh, uh, you're not reelected? That isn't even a hard question, Bill. Uh, uh, my roots in this city are so deep. Uh, I plan to stay. I hope my daughter stays. I hope her children stay. Uh, it's always about the future of this city. It's always about our children and their children. Uh, nothing else matters. Uh, it isn't even a, a tough question. So I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, I hope to continue. Uh, I believe that I, uh, that I can, but uh, regardless, the city is more important than any of this. Thank you. So it's time for uh, closing remarks. Uh, Councilwoman, you have two minutes. Thank and you. You have three minutes, but if you could keep it to three two, minutes. all the better. Let's keep Thank it to two minutes. <laughs> uh, well, I wanted to say thanks to all of you that are here, to all of you that have the stamina to listen on the radio today, and to the mayor for the conversation, and to you, Bill, for the, um, the management of the conversation. Um, this conversation today has been like ones that we've had for the last seven forums. Um, reflects the questions and concerns from the thousands of voters that I've talked to at your doorsteps, in your neighborhood coffee shops, and in other places as well. We all care deeply about this community, but recognize that there are tough challenges ahead because of the progress we've made. You're asking for leadership to listen to you, to share her vision with you, and to link the two together. You've asked for urgency around affordable housing because you're concerned about what's next. You've told us that your commutes are longer and you want to see progress that you aren't seeing from us. I have heard you and I carry your stories with me. And if I have the honor to earn your vote again on December 3rd, I will carry them into the mayor's office. And I know that our best days are ahead that we can do so much when we roll up our sleeves, engage the community, believe in ourselves that we have the answers, and deeply work to accomplish them so that we can provide our kids those houses they need, the jobs they need to come back here, the life in this valley that we all know to be true today that we want to see tomorrow. It's been an incredible honor to hear your stories, to have your trust, to be part of this conversation to our to improve our city in the long run. So again, I hope to have your vote again on December 3rd. And I am truly honored that you would consider it, and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Well, I, uh, I want to thank uh, the City Club for having this. It's been great watching your faces engaged in this. Uh, I've been doing this a while, and I can tell when people are in on things uh, and when they're not, and you all have been. And I really appreciate that. Uh, this, uh, with all due respect, has not been at all like the forums that we have, uh, where six people would bludgeon me for an hour or more, uh, and then we'd go home. Uh, and uh, pardon my uh, 
If uh, I need to say that, uh, it, it's, it's very great to have uh, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion of these issues where the contrasts uh, come in, uh, into play. Uh, and I just think they couldn't be any more prominent in this discussion. Uh, listening is so important. I've been listening since the first day. I listened to the woman that cut my hair this morning when she said, Mayor, I grew up here. I moved to Seattle. I came back because I didn't like what I saw that. Uh, and she said, don't allow this city to be like that. We are different. Uh, we come together and help each other. Uh, but we, we have standards and we have uh, a clean, safe environment. Uh, crime's gone down 45% since I took office. It's so good that it, it isn't even asked. Uh, this is a fragile situation, folks. It could turn on a dime. We've seen that all around the country. Uh, I, it, it, it's an honor to be the mayor. I've treated it like this every day. Uh, I want to continue forward and make a great city even better. Uh, I'm positioned to make the tough decisions, some of which we don't even know what they are. Uh, I, I, I want your vote. Uh, December 3rd is an important time. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is the stack of questions I didn't get to. So, so those of you whose questions I didn't ask, I apologize. There will be more events. Uh, but the most important thing is to remember to vote on December 3rd. So <clears throat> for our radio audience, you've been listening to a City Club Forum with uh, Mayor Dave Beter and Councilwoman Lauren McLean on the mayoral runoff for December 3rd. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.